good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Saturday morning for our FB LMTA um, ECC webinar. Um, I know it's a mouthful, but uh, we were trying to pl be playful about it as well. Uh, but essentially this morning we'll be talking about comprehensive evaluation and reports for blind and low vision students. Um, on the title slide, you will see a bit.ly link and this link will give you um, a handouts folder. So it's a Google folder um, and there's a bunch of items in there that we will explain a little bit more as we go along the webinar. Uh, that link is http colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash fvlmta dash webinar 2020. And the link is case sensitive, so everything um, needs to be lowercase. And you will get this link again a couple times at the end of the presentation. Um, we are doing this webinar in honor of CTE BVI 2020. This is a California transcribers and educators of blind and visually impaired students that usually happens every year in California. This year we were meant to be in LA. Uh, we flip flop every other year, LA and San Francisco. Um, so uh, we had prepared this presentation for the conference and wanted to be able to still deliver it to you guys. And we're so excited that we can open it up on a broader level too. Um, so my name is Ting Su. I should, probably should have started with that. Um, I'm the program coordinator and assistant professor of the TVI program at San Francisco State University. And I'll let my uh, co-presenters introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Vanessa Herndon and I am the Low Vision Clinic Program Coordinator at California School for the Blind. Thank you, Ting. Thank you, Vanessa. My name is Adrian Amandi. I'm the Director of the Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. And thank you everyone um, who is joining us on a wonderful Saturday morning amidst the current stressors of our work from home and work from school, our school from home world. Um, this is not a webinar discussing new processes or techniques in assessing students in a distance model. So we'll be thankful that this is a face mask free zone. <laughs> All right, Ting, can you advance the slide? There you go. Um, so uh, a couple points of business. Um, due to the wonderful attendance, we might have to um, we might have to switch over to some people over to YouTube. At the moment, we look clear. But also, due to the number of people, we will not be taking direct questions or comments during the <laughs> webinar. Um, if you include your questions and your comments into the chat feature, um, whether it's here in Zoom or if anyone is on. YouTube Live. Um, after the webinar, Ting, Vanessa, and I will review the questions and put together a shared document um, responding to them that we'll email out to everybody that registered and linked to our um, YouTube page as well. Uh, anticipate that, and within the within a week or two, when we post our um, when we post our YouTube, edit it up onto the site. Um, Again, uh, please complete the questionnaire that Ting pointed out as well. This will give you an, a potential opportunity to partner with us um, in creating a more thorough template that we'll share with you today um, and for you to ask any more further questions that you have. Okay. Let's change the slide. All right, are we ready to get going? Yeah, woo! All right, why comprehensive evaluations? We're gonna get into the thick of this idea because it matters, because families are tired of being confused by standalone reports that sometimes contradict themselves or that often fail to become interconnected and thus truly provide evidence-based solutions to observed and assessed needs. This presentation will review the types of assessment and evaluation we use for students with visual impairment. There are several inherent challenges for all of you as you listen today as you construct your questions, and as you go forward with your future assessments. Do you assess students only when they are new to your caseload or when a triennial IEP rears its time-consuming head? I know many of us do. Or do you keep with the intention of student evaluation and practice ongoing evaluation? As each student grows up and advances in school, their literacy, learning media, and accommodations will change. The technology meeting their needs at one stage will change, sometimes dramatically, at another stage. It is essential in the premise of this presentation that we not only regularly evaluate the changing needs of our students, 
but that we respect the results from each aspect of our assessments and recognize how one impacts the others. We are challenged with every assessment to determine how a visual impairment adversely affects a child's educational performance. This is mandated by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, and our own local educational codes. As practitioners, we know there are limitations in what we do and what we can pass. We know that it is difficult to complete a functional vision assessment without the results of a vision exam. We also know that the results of a functional vision assessment help identify the most appropriate media in a learning media assessment and that these results together help us understand what technology and assistive technology to provide and how to best adapt the core curriculum and teach the expanded core curriculum. What we sometimes miss though is the basis of good evaluation, that we should rely on no single measure and that we should consider multiple environments, materials, and tools to get appropriate assessment results. Advances, <coughs> my apology. Advances in technology, ah, I lost my notes, um, and accessibility of technology is why we can no longer look at individual assessment reports as separate and distinct. Technology has woven itself into the very existence of every aspect of our students, and thus it plays an instrumental role in how we assess as well. A student's functional vision will be, depend on the tools we provide them and instruct them to use. A student will read and write dependent on how accessible we make those tasks. The world of braille or large print is behind us. We now look at changes on the fly and programs and tools that encompass multiple types of media simultaneously. Technology has expanded what our students have access to and in doing so has complicated completing functional vision assessments, learning media assessments, technology and expanded core curriculum evaluations in isolation. Thus, we challenge you to consider all evaluations together and complete comprehensive vision evaluations for the students you work with. This conceptual framework of taking all assessments in our field and completing them in their entirety with respect to and acknowledgement of their interconnectedness and relationships is the premise of a comprehensive vision exam. We encourage you all to look at a total child in a holistic evaluation process. Consider their strengths and weaknesses, their learning preferences, and determine the tools and potential adaptations necessary for them to thrive. You will need to do this with acknowledgement of your state's own education codes. I encourage each of you to be familiar with educational codes encompassing special education and assessment, and most importantly, visual impairment in your own state. It is also important to understand the IDEA, as well as be familiar with policy letters and memos from the United States Department of Education, Office of Special Education. While we are able to speak on behalf of working in California, there may be minor differences in your own state. All right, can we switch slides? All right, to the meat of it. A comprehensive evaluation for educational vision services includes functional vision assessments, learning media assessments, technology assessments, expanded core curriculum, needs assessments. Oh my, even on the slide. All right, I don't know if anyone in the chat knows of anyone in this field who thought it was gonna be easy when they got into this field and I can direct them here in sunny California to a burger flipping job that pays pretty well. Uh, <laughs> The trick is going to be in how you're able to wrap up the data you collect. We'll review each of these aspects now, starting with the functional vision assessment. So the functional vision assessment is one of the many assessments that TVIs have to do, and this assessment has many implications for the student. Um, the California Ed Code Section 56352 states, that a functional vision assessment conducted pursuant to section 56.320 shall be used as one criterion in developing an appropriate reading medium or media for the pupil. So we'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, as we know, the functional vision exam, though it does help inform reading media, also gives us a lot of other information about the student. This exam tells us how the student is using their vision. It's done as a supplement to a clinical eye exam, and it describes the student's observable visual behaviors. And the purpose of this is to determine eligibility 
well, eligibility for VI services. So in this type of report, teachers assess the student's use of functional vision, determine if their vision has an impact on their access to the environment and classroom, and then makes recommendations based on these findings. And these findings and recommendations are the groundwork for everything else that's to come. Next slide. Um, so this evaluation of vision is key to first, understanding the student's functional vision, and second, essential to delineating what media and devices will provide access to these students. Um, so it is the groundwork because you need to know how the student will access information, and typically the FEA is done first. Knowing what and how efficiently the student sees gives you information about how to proceed in other assessments for yourself and for other members of the IEP teams. Um, it gives validity to all other assessments because, for example, you can't test reading speed accurately if the student does not have appropriate access to the text. So this is really our cornerstone of the entire assessment. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Ting to talk about the LMA. Thank you. <clears throat> um, conducting the, the FBA, LMA, um, AT and EC in this presentation that we're presenting, this is also what defines us um, as TVIs and defines our practice differently from other therapists or related service personnel. Um, so this is also why um, uh, all of these different components of the comprehensive evaluation process is so important. So after doing that FDA, um, the LMA is the, in a natural next step in assessment. In California Ed Code um, 56352, uh, Part B, uh, it states that a local educational agency may provide pupils with low vision with the opportunity to receive assessments to determine the appropriate reading medium or media including Braille instruction for the pupils. Part C states that the determination by a pupil's individualized education program team of the most appropriate medium or media. And uh, part C uh, states that each visually impaired pupil shall be provided with the opportunity to receive an assessment to determine the appropriate reading medium or media, including Braille instruction, if appropriate, for that pupil. Um, <clears throat> know that when you guys guys have the slide handouts, you guys will also get the hyperlinks in the notes section of these slides to the direct language of the law. And again, this is um, relevant to uh, California. Uh, so we wanted to give you guys the legalities to uh, help you justify your, your practice and assessment approaches so that you can lean on the law um, to justify your approaches to assessment. So the takeaway of the LMA is that assessment and instruction of appropriate reading media are key to a blind or low vision student's individualized education program. This comprehensive evaluation process is needed for any student where uh, vision might be a consideration for impeding their access to education. Um, it is less relevant what the actual diagnosis is. And um, I'm gonna throw it back to Vanessa to talk a little bit about AT. Um, so another assessment that must be consider considered is AT. AT or assistive technology is pervasive, um, or technology is pervasive in our everyday world, but assistive technology is an integral part of the way many students who are blind or visually impaired will be successful. Um, it's defined in the Education Code Section 1401, Title 20, as any item piece of equipment or product system, whether acquired commercially without the need for modification, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of an individual with exceptional needs. Uh, furthermore, assistive technology service is defined as any service that directly assists a child with a disability in the selection, acquisition, or the use of assistive technology devices. And this includes the evaluation of the needs of such child, including a functional evaluation in their customary environment. So as you can see, students not only by law should be receiving assistive technology, but we should also be evaluating these needs in a meaningful way specific to the student and their environment. We can go to the next slide. 
So we gain three things from doing an AT assessment. And the first is what technology tools will help the student increase, maintain, or improve their functional abilities and access to information. So this information pulled with info from the FBA and LMA will give you hard data to justify your purchasing and the outcome hopefully is that the technology is relevant to the student and it's not living in the closet because it matches up with the student's needs, ability, and their growth potential. Um, Ting will talk a little bit more later about AT assessment and collaboration and what TVIs bring specifically, but you have so much knowledge about how your student needs to access their environment to be successful that in collaboration with a team, you can really create meaningful uh, justifications or meaningful recommendations that are justified. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, and just a little time out here for um, terms and I'm gonna pop in periodically to talk about terminology. Um, you'll notice that in the law, it's really referred to as assistive technology for AT um, and by all means that term is still relevant um, to describe all those specialized technologies that truly assist people in their lives. Um, I, I propose that we also start thinking about using the term access technology because I believe it is a broader term that better describes how technology functions to facilitate people's access to information. Um, you'll see in my new book actually that um, I do use the term access rather than assistive. Um, so I think right now we're in this period of transition where the terms can be utilized interchangeably. What I also like about access that it better empowers the person who's using the technology to access information. It's less of this idea of assistance or support or dependency. Um, and it really puts the power of accessing information back into the hands of our students and users. Um, uh, another term that, you know, I just to keep in the back of your minds is in special ed, we often use the term inclusive. Um, and this very much is a term that is, um, you know, quote unquote, special ed. Um, in the broader context, uh, the term universal access is more often used. And I feel that by using universal rather than inclusive, you get better buy-in because general ed teachers, admins, IT specialists, technologists understand universal access, universal design, uh, UDL, universal design for learning. Um, so again, inclusive and universal are also interchangeable, um, but I do like universal um, to help get that greater buy-in. And Okay, thank you, that's my plug. Pound sign, Dr. Ting Su. You guys should get access to her new book at APH, which has just come out in the last uh, last few weeks. All right, the expanded core cur curriculum, the ECC. We need to be more firm about the insistence and inclusion of the ECC goals and progress for our students. While it was labeled only 25 years ago, the expanded core curriculum has become the foundation of our employment and the services we provide to students. As professionals, we need to quit bringing only compensatory orientation and mobility and technology to the forefront and recognize that through assessment that an individual student's principal needs in the ECC will vary. They might be the difference between social inclusion and long-term success. So the ECC has started to take a front seat. California recently passed Assembly Bill 947, acknowledging its importance and stating that local education agencies may consider teaching the expanded core curriculum. Texas has provided a great guide to a shall compared to California's may, which puts into place a mandatory expectation with Texas Education Code 30.002. We need to move forward as individual states in advancing our own legislation and begin to work towards something like legislating the national agenda for the education of children and youths with visual impairments, including those with multiple disabilities. Hope that's something everyone's heard of, but if not, again, you'll be able to link to it in, the, in uh, our slideshow. If you could go to the next slide. We must recognize that assessment in the expanded core curriculum requires ongoing assessment that does not start and stop with IEP dates. <clears throat> Families, general education teachers, and other service providers and paraprofessionals can all be instrumental to helping a student learn with expanded core skills. It is with guidance from a TVI and O&M specialist 
that the team determines what the most pressing areas of need that need to be focused on are. There are multiple screening tools and assessments available. I encourage every vision specialist to become familiar with at least one that will lead to identifying primary areas of need and discovered that are often discovered by interviewing and gathering input from families, other team members, and don't forget the student as well. Um, we need to do observation and also direct assessment. All right, next slide. All right, here's an acronym to help you remember to take into consideration all the potential sources of information in any problem solving approach. R-I-T-O-T, if I can spell it right, because it's a riot to complete. Uh -huh. um, you can all determine if riot has a positive or negative connotation. All right, review historical records and products, interview key stakeholders, Observe, ob observation is to observe student performance in real time functional settings um, and test is to test your hypothesis and what students, what might benefit the student. All right, Ting, if you press spacebar. We recognize just how hard juggling a full workload is while trying to assess a student with validity. So we developed a new acronym, R-E-P-O-R-T, REPORT. This acronym with each letter's expansion, um, just faded in to, as an animation on the slide. Um, R, rethink my career path. Remember, this is after we realize that we have to do this all with validity and do full comprehensive vision reports, um, and or maybe just this field as a whole. R, rethink my career path. E, evaluate if I am headed in the right direction. P, now pacify my heightened anxiety. O, observe other thing, others doing things they are good at, possibly in other career paths. R, rationalize that it's time to move on. And T, time to start flipping burgers. And for those of you who don't know Adrian and Mandy from CSB, this is definitely delivered with a healthy dose of snark. <laughs> oh, not to say that as, as I said before, you can get $17 an hour around here. Flipping burger. It doesn't pay rent, though. <laughs> Anyways. Oh. All right. Um, on to some more serious things. Uh, while we could talk for a while about the guidelines for assessment outlined in IDEA, we can focus on the big highlight. Educational assessment cannot be based on the results of a single test. So go forth and shove them all together. Um, but in doing so, remember that informal interim assessments happen all the time in multiple locations with the support of all educational team members. I've already seen multiple people in the chat repeat and encourage us that assessment and evaluation are happening all the time. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. All right, next slide. At some point, we have to be honest with ourselves and recognize that we are likely, we will not have the time or the bandwidth to fully assess each area within a comprehensive vision of Val the way we want to. Anyone who has ever replaced their gym membership with the purchase of evals um, from published by the Texas School for the Blind understands this, as does anyone fortunate enough to have picked up Dr. Ting Su's new Access Technology for the Blind and Low Vision Accessibility book and traded nights and weekends, I do mean all of them, to complete a full assistive technology evaluation. I would keep teasing her about this one um, if I hadn't helped her put it together. <laughs> um, while we may not be able to completely do a thorough evaluation in each area, when we conduct a holistic needs assessment, we are able to collect reliable data and define the instructional priorities of students with visual impairments. Um, so wait, are we talking about assessments or evaluations here? Um, this seems like, you know, when I first started in the field, it seemed like a matter of semantics to me. And I thought it was just, you know, a bunch of boring professors arguing about terms. And now I've become one of those <laughs> professors who argue about terms. Um, so we wanted to um, take a minute here because so far we've been using that word assessments a lot. And assessment is used in our field. We talk about the FBA, LMA, but truly, um, you know, those terms are also used interchangeably with FBE or LME. Um, in the laws as it states, it also refers to assessment. Um, 
I mean, if you wanted to get technical, assessment typically refers to a particular test. Um, it's a more uh, formal thing that you use for testing. What we really are describing here is evaluation as a way to describe it as a process. So um, even though we are using the word assessments, um, conceptually, we're really thinking of it in terms of evaluation to evaluate all the broad range of needs of the student um, to figure out what to prioritize for instruction and justify services and all that. So um, a comprehensive vision evaluation is truly a process that does a couple things. Uh, number one, we need to do this so that we can capture a student's learning needs to figure out what they need to access their education. Um, it also helps us identify curricular priorities. Um, you know, sometimes with certain students, it can seem so overwhelming of the, uh, the mass of stuff that we have to teach students. Uh, so we're gonna go into uh, the next step of the process here um, to give a little bit more guidance about how do I identify these curricular priorities and um, how can I design instruction so it's gonna have the greatest cascading impact. Um, <clears throat> A comprehensive vision evaluation is also a process that describes how accommodations, alternate media, and technology supports access to education and also information. Um, it really is descriptive in the body of the report so that people can understand why you're recommending certain accommodations. Um, as, Bra as Adrian mentioned earlier, it's not just about Braille and large print, but alter media, alternate media encompasses um, both Braille, large print, so you like, you know, paper physical media, but also now we're in the time we need to think about digital multimedia and how to ensure that all of those formats are accessible. Uh, we're we're going to take you through a process of how you're going to thread through technology and how it supports each area of functional vision and learning media and the ECC. Um, and finally, the outcomes of this comprehensive vision evaluation is that ultimately it's got to support your recommendations to the IEP team. Um, I say this over and over to my TVI students at San Francisco State that you should not have or, or that every bulleted recommendation on your list at the end of a report should have data that's tied to it. And if there's no data tied to it, it's not a strong recommendation um, because ultimately these recommendations have to justify services, has to justify whatever support staff might be needed and justifies materials, equipment, technology, um, and all those things that get wrapped up in everything that we do. So uh, when we look at the comprehensive uh, evaluation as a process, um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll see how each assessment really informs the next. Um, so as Vanessa had mentioned, that FVA is kind of the, the big bowling ball at the beginning that starts the, the process that uh, feeds into the LMA and the AT. And um, at the end of it, it should help you prioritize which areas of the ECC um, are really gonna be the most meaningful for the students. So um, Adrian talked about mushing everything together. So let's get into the mush of it and figure out how do we synthesize something, uh, all of these uh, areas of data into a complete package that's gonna be meaningful for the team to read and use and um, follow as a guidance document for implementing very effective services. So um, one thing that I go back to a lot when I think about doing that needs assessment for a student um, is the TPAC framework. Uh, the TPAC framework, uh, it stands for technology, pedagogical, and content knowledge. Um, it's a theoretical framework uh, from these two researchers, Mishra and Kohler, um, in 2006. That's when they first published about it. And they published this framework to describe how technology can be integrated into education and into how teachers can teach their students. Um, I really like this because it recognizes the strengths of different team members and what they bring into the process. Um, so starting with technological knowledge, this is knowledge of the technology that a student needs. It's acknowledging um, what the advantages are or limitations or constraints of different technology. And it's really describing that understanding of what technology is gonna benefit a student. Um, people who can help you with figuring out the technology knowledge related to a student 
are going to be your IT specialists, your AT specialists, um, super techie friends, uh, techie blind or low vision people who use technology. But there are a lot of different people um, who you can build out in your community of practice who can help you construct the technology knowledge. The second part of TPAC as relevant to TVIs is pedagogical knowledge. So this is really our wheelhouse, you guys. This is understanding how students learn, how students are using their sensory learning channels, um, how different information need to be represented in different formats uh, for meaningful representation. So this is our strength in our practice is being able to interpret how a blind or low vision student learns and how they need to access information. And then content knowledge describes that area um, that is maintaining that expectation for learning, um, maintaining high standards for learning for all of our students. And so this is where those check-ins with your classroom teachers and parents and paras becomes very important to understand what is it that's happening in the classroom, whether it's academics or functional academics, what's going on? You know, what, what's the learning standard? Um, what are the core standards here? Um, what are the activities that the classroom teacher is designing that I need to be aware of so I can be sure my student can access? And then um, you'll see on the slide, it's actually a, a Venn diagram where each of these areas of knowledge are a circle. And in the very middle, they all intersect. And this is the sweet spot of TPAP where when we have a good needs assessment to get information in each of these areas of TPAP, then we can zero in on that middle sweet spot and say, okay, this is how I prioritize. This is what's gonna be the most important for my student. And this is where I can lesson plan and make the most efficient use of my time and instruction. Um, and we will go uh, more into this. Uh, in, so this is just an introduction. Okay, so how does the technology plug in? Um, Adrian mentioned a little bit that, you know, in the book, we take people through this comprehensive um, AT, access tech, assistive technology evaluation. And, you know, it's one thing to complete a full out e like technology evaluation. Oftentimes an AT specialist or a CATA certified AT specialist will get called in and you'll get like a 15 to 20 page tech eval. Um, However, in terms of what we need to do as TVIs, and you know that within the scope of our practice, we are, or we should be trained, and we um, are justified in our practice to evaluate and recommend technology specific to VI. So how do we do that in a way that's not like a 15, 20 page report slapped onto the FEA and LMA? So this is how we need to talk about and think about how technology integrates into the data and integrates um, into how a student needs to use technology as one of among many other tools to access their education. So one part of it is um, just identifying what tools a student needs to use and what skills they need in order to make informed decisions about which tools they're gonna use for which tasks. But the other part of it is understanding formats. And this is becoming more and more important as our classrooms get more digital and classrooms are using a lot of digital and multimedia. So now we're also really needing to take on the role of being an accessibility facilitator so that we can do that training to our teams to say, hey, when you guys give out um, a document, uh, it really, we need, it's important that it's in this certain format. So we can do a lot of advising and guidance and training and consults really about what alternate media means and how to make sure that those are all accessible. Um, so there's an accessibility tip sheet that I can drop into our webinar handouts um, after this presentation. So that will be there for you guys. Um, and, uh, you know, from your FEA, that gives us an idea of how students use that functional vision. And based on that information, that can give you a starting point in identifying what features of technology the student needs. Based on if a student needs larger print, they're going to need something to give them the ability to magnify? Is it something that's a contrast? Is it something with visual field? And we actually don't want to magnify that much, but we need the ability to resize. Um, from the learning media assessment, if we know that a student's primary access is visual, we need to have really good um, uh, you know, visual accessibility features in the technology. And then if the student also needs secondary access with auditory mode, 
we're going to need to look at technology that might give that student on-demand auditory. And then you can drill down a little bit to see, well, is it just text-to-speech or do we really need to go screen reader at this point? Or if a student's really more of a tactile learner, then that's going to give you a starting point for looking at technology um, that's going to give tactile access. So, okay, are we looking at refreshable Braille? And if so, how is this refreshable Braille going to be used to support different activities so that I can figure out um, what flavor of refreshable Braille device my student needs? And then, you know, then you kind of start figuring out um, your technology toolbox that's going to support all those access needs as uh, described by the FBA and LMA. Ting Su, I thought we locked the slideshow from editing. <laughs> I, you know, you guys, it's all this COVID-19 mask wearing. Ting hasn't had a chance to stand on her soapbox and tell the populace her standard quote, technology is everything. Vanessa and I heard it 18 times before the presentation started, but uh, here it is again, slid in at last minute. 18 times. I could have sworn we just mentioned it maybe one time. <laughs> 18. Okay, so I say often that technology is everything, meaning that technology is just ubiquitous in our lives. Um, I bet if we went around the virtual room right now and I asked you guys how many pieces of technology you touched, even on a Saturday morning before coming onto this webinar, many of you guys would have said, one or two or three, or actually many of you most would have said two or three pieces of technology. So just think about the ubiquity of technology in your own lives, how often you use technology, how many different types of technology you use, and how technology has really changed the nature of how you engage with your life. I mean, even calling somebody on the phone, we're no longer dialing numbers, so we're not dialing a number, but we're dialing a person because it's a contact on our phone. So it's changed how we even think about um, engagement with our daily lives. And that same goes for our students. Our students need to have those early and incidental um, experiences with technology because technology is pervasive now. It touches most, almost every aspect of um, students learning and engaging with, with information. But having said that, and here's my soapbox, everything is not technology because our students still need to have those early training experiences to develop um, their functional vision and know how to maximize use of functional vision. They still need to train their ears um, to listen for learning. And they also need to train their fingers for tactile learning. Um, so this is also why um, these experiences with technology need to start early because it, it supports how our students need to use their different senses to use the technology, whether it's no, low, or high tech. Um, so students still need really good training to use whatever sensory learning channels that are relevant for the student. And they still need really good training in life and you know, um, getting access to those compensatory skills in all areas of the ECC and just those lived experiences. And yes, students still need good access to really good high quality embossed braille materials and instruction and access to high quality tactile graphics. Um, technology is simply another tool um, among a, a range of, of tools that every student should have at their disposal. Okay, off the soapbox. <laughs> Um, so this slide might look familiar. These points were made by Ting when discussing a comprehensive evaluation process and everything outlined in the evaluation process should align with the report. So the report should also reflect these five things, capture the students learning needs, identify curricular priorities, describe how they will access their education and information through accommodations, alternate media and technology. Um, supports recommendations to the IEP team, and justifies services. That's a lot to ask, but if we could put all of this data into one meaningful report, all of the data from our ECC, our AT, our LMA, our FBA, our needs assessment, and we synthesized it, we would have one place that represents the student as a learner or as a whole, and one place for other IEP team members or parents to look at for any of the VI-related information. So we're going to take a look at an outline, but first let's jump to the next slide. 
On this slide, there are 10 bullet points, um, which I will discuss while coming through the actual template that we've put through for, uh, or that Ting has for a comprehensive vision assessment. Um, these bullet points are all headers in the template, and the template will be shared with you through that bit.ly link along with other handouts and resources. So let's see how this all comes together. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the um, outline. I'm going to stop the PowerPoint so we can switch to the report and Vanessa will be our lovely tour guide. Um, you guys will see when you open your um, handouts folder, by the way, that everything is um, share, shared on Google, but it's in the uh, native Microsoft Word format. So you can actually, in, when you open the folder, you can actually open the file and do your report in Google Docs, if that's your preference, but you can also download it and then do your report in Microsoft Word, if that's your preference, okay? So um, here's what it looks like in the Google Doc. So, we start with um, our student background, and this anchors our report. It presents the student first with some relevant background information, um, including their age, where they are, their diagnosis and medical history, um, and then evaluation conditions. Where are we doing this assessment, which is important to consider when you're talking about validity of your assessment. And then we're gonna scroll down to the functional vision assessment. So this is really the first piece of like data that we have, giving us a picture of what and how the student sees and setting us up for our digesting all the rest. Um, you'll notice in here, there's much of the typical functional vision information outlined for you to include in your report, but Depending on your student, you can add more to it if you need. Then we have our learning media assessment, which tells us how the student best uses their sensory learning channels to access curriculum and materials. And we consider this for both tasks at near and at a distance. So already you're kind of seeing some overlap depending on how you do your functional vision assessment and your learning media assessment that doing things at near and at far sometimes are in the FEA. Here we suggest that you're also including it in your learning media assessment because that reading comes at both near and distance tasks such as copying notes from the board or taking notes while listening. Um, these are going to inform us later about how our AT will be set up, and I'll talk about that in a second. So after we get the important information from the FVA and the LMA, it should tell us if a student qualifies for vision services, meaning they would benefit from the nine areas of the ECC. So now we find ourselves at the ECC. Um, and here we have just a short blurb about how the ECC is important and um, it outlines what the ECC is. Um, under that, we suggest that you prioritize curricular areas in the ECC with our first suggestion being assistive technology. So here's where we suggest that you put your information about how your student accesses information through AT specifically. And this can also be throughout. You might be doing a learning media assessment and the student you find does best by listening and reading in Braille at the same time, and that's their best way to comprehend text. So in this section, you're still going to be using the information that you find from your FEA and your LMA to justify assistive technology. Um, and here we also suggest that when you're talking about the technology the student uses, you're keeping it um, not specific to brands. Like for example, instead of iPad, you want to state the technology with its specific purposes, such as if your student you needed text to speech and magnification, then you would put a tablet with text to speech and magnification versus an iPad. And this keeps your report more flexible. Um, and while I understand there might be like 
questions about justifying purchases because you need to have some name in the report in order to justify purchasing an iPad, we do recommend that instead you do an addendum, an AT request addendum at the end because you want your report to reflect the student's needs um, and not that they only need an iPad. You know, something might come out tomorrow that fits their needs a little bit better and then you can point to this report um, and say specifically why that technology will work for them. So we can keep scrolling down. Um, we have eligibility, it's always important. The main reason we do this is to say the student is el eligible for VI services, right? The main legal reason, at least. Um, so we have that and we'll scroll down to progress on goals and proposed future goals and the big finale our recommendations. So the recommendation section, there's only one. It should pull all of the data from everything that you found into one space. So it should be tied directly to your findings and it's the accumulation of all of your assessment. It's the conclusion of your report. Um, it's the synthesis of everything that you've done already. So that is the report. At the end, we do suggest you put the students' testing accommodations so that they correspond to the visual needs and um, your recommendations and so that they can be easily found. But that's the report and um, hopefully you see how we've tried to capture students' learning needs, identify curricular priorities, you know, describe accommodations and, and um, have recommendations recommendations that are justified and easy for anybody to read. And this full template, an example of what it looks like filled out, and an example of an AT addendum will all be available to you through the bit.ly link. Okay, thanks for that tour, Vanessa. Um, so I really like this template layout because it embeds the information that you get from your FDA, LMA, and ECC into very practical um, activities that any teacher um, on the IEP team, any administrator can read this report and envision how this is going to look in instruction. So remember that the purpose of the comprehensive evaluation process is to get a holistic view of the student and what they need to access their education. Um, the report um, is best used as a guidance document for the IEP team and for parents, um, and also for students, so that the students can understand why they need the things they need in order to learn. Um, and parents can know how to advocate if needed. Um, but again, it's really that focus on what, the, what are the tasks and activities the student needs to engage in um, and, and be, be empowered to, to do. We, uh... Always, always remember the infusion and integration of technology is what got us here too. Um, if it wasn't for the infusion and integration of technology throughout all of our lessons and curricula and learning, um, we wouldn't have such a need to infuse it into the assessment itself. So um, as this is what brought us to this point of creating this comprehensive vision uh, eval as opposed to separate and distinct things, um, we now need to recognize when tech is being used. I think some of us are becoming more uh, passive to its involvement and forgetting that uh, a tremendous amount of technology is going into our students' daily um, actions and how they are integrating and behaving with their, um, with their peers outside of school and with their academics inside of school. So um, when you're assessing, please recognize the technology that is being used, the technology that could be used. Um, and rather than focus on assistive tech in and of itself, which I think many of us have done for many years, uh, we're now doing that integrated within the FBA and LMA. Am I still going? Did we not organize? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. Was <laughs> um, sure if you no, I, the last bullet point here is represent the student as a learner. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, you'll have some resources to the RIOT and ICEL framework, but really acknowledging the variety of things we look at when assessing 
a student. It's, uh, it is about the learner themselves. It's also about their environment, the curricula, and the individual lessons that go into every day of school. But true to our field, true to being teachers of the visually impaired and orientation specialists and paraprofessionals that support our kids, is that the learner themselves is housed with, thankfully, a guidance document of the expanded core curriculum. Um, and these assessments are really getting us to the point where we are making school accessible, their social lives accessible, and them on a path to independence. Um, and we do that best when we look at that student as an individual themselves, where we respect their family, their parents, and all members of the educational team, and let them walk us through what those students' needs are. And if I could add another comment to that last bullet, um, you know, in our field, we have a lot of forms and checklists that help us collect the data. Uh, my current favorite is the Essential Tools Binder from TSBVI. Um, but we have a lot of forms available for data collection. And the idea of having a comprehensive report is that we can make sure we're not just doing a data dump. Um, so we use the forms and checklists to gather the data, and then we have to actually put it together and connect it so that we're representing and creating a narrative of the student as a learner in this report format. Um, so it looks like we have a few minutes. Um, I wanted to bring us back to the handouts folder to be sure that everybody has the link. Um, in this folder, you'll see uh, one document that has the webinar references and resources. Uh, we recognize that this presentation is a, a very, very broad skim of the things that go into a comprehensive evaluation. And I mean, each mini component of this uh, process and report could be its own other offshoot of a webinar. So in the references document, you'll find references for um, additional professional development about each area of how do I conduct an FBA, LMA, how do I do more technology, um, compare uh, justifying decisions, and how do I evaluate the ECC. Um, so you'll find references and resources there. Um, there's also a really nice document on the history of assessment that Adrian put together. Um, just for any history nerds out there who uh, want to see how we arrived at where we are now in terms of capturing student needs and uh, purposes of assessment. You'll also see the report template in there. Um, and the, the template, do note that the template is formatted for accessibility. So if you're in Google Docs, you can use the document outline to see how the headers are laid out. If you're in Microsoft Word, it also has headers. So this ensures that students can uh, be able to navigate and read their own reports. If you're working with any Department of Rehab counselors who are also blind or visually impaired, they will also have equivalent access to these documents. I think it's really important that we uh, walk the walk and talk the talk, talk the talk, walk the walk, um, so that we are part of the, 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 you know, the action to ensure that all media are accessible to everybody. Um, we should absolutely be only disseminating accessible media ourselves. Um, and finally, in the folder, you'll see a link to a post-webinar um, survey evaluation slash questionnaire. Um, you'll also get that in the email that will be sent out to you post-webinar. And uh, you know, we are playing around with the idea of possibly making a Mad Lib type of tool where you could plop in your information and it would help spit out um, a, a report template that you could update. So we're looking for feedback from you guys to see um, how would that be used? Uh, what do you think needs to go in there? And know that this report template, it's just a starting point. There might be things that um, are missed. Um, it could be, it, there are some other considerations that could be in there. So we'd love to know what works and what doesn't work. Um, so it's this, we really appreciate this opportunity um, to really get our field to think about this. And it's important to us that it's a collective effort. And credit, credit to Stephanie Herlick, who's watching our California School for the Blinds Assessment Center coordinator for being the lead on the Mad Lib generation. Uh, those of you who are interested, she will be in touch. And credit also to Cheryl Kamei Hannon. Um, at California, uh, California State University, Los Angeles. I even have a diploma from there um, for participating and helping us generate that as well. We hope all of you will be there too. Um, sadly, you all, I had a solid 35 minutes on history presentation that Ting and Vanessa scratched saying that wasn't the pure point of this. 
Um, but the, the handout does not do it justice, but another, another day, another time. Um, we appreciate all of you. Um, this last slide says, thank you for joining us. It has the HTTP colon slash slash bit.ly slash FBLMTA dash webinar 2020. All letters are lowercase. Uh, bit.ly's um, caps do matter. It has the CSB, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube handle. Did I get that right, Ting? Is yep. it called a handle? Ooh, my tech is coming out. At CSB Cheetahs, as well as the San Francisco State uh, handle at VI Program SFSU. Um, as well as our own titles. Again, I'm Adrian Amandi, Director of uh, the Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. My email is amandi at csb-cde.ca.gov. I look forward to hearing more from you all. Um, further questions that didn't make it to the comments, make sure they make it into the questionnaire. Um, and we'll look forward to continuing this. And also Vanessa, uh, her yeah. name? Vanessa Herndon, I'm um, the Low Vision Clinic Program Coordinator. Um, my email is vherndon at csb-cde.ca.gov. Of course, you can reach out with me to me with any questions about this or about FEAs or about reading um, clinical vision reports or if you're in California and you want your student to have a low vision exam, um, reach out to me at any time. And, oh, and then uh, I'm Ting Su, and I'm over at San Francisco State, so uh, applications are rolling all year round, and our classes are all on Zoom. Uh, you can also email me at ysiu at sfsu.edu, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a Twitter bird, so I'm on Twitter at tvi underscore Ting. And wow, you guys, we made it. We're really we good. Thanks, everybody. Everybody from around the country in California, make sure you join us 2021 California Transcribers and Educators for the Visually Impaired, um, CTEBVI. It's a wonderful conference. It uh, it's typically runs about 80 sessions and is a wonderful chance for more professional development um, and probably us hopefully releasing and updating this template um, at least by then. So um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Please give yourselves a round of applause us for doing this professional development on a Saturday. Um, be well, be safe out there, and thanks, thanks for coming. Okay. Bye guys. Thank you. Joint effort by California School for the Blind, San Francisco State University, California Transcribers and Educators for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and Cal State University, Los Angeles. Video editing by Monica Kulani, SFSU VI Program Manager.